Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is David Cole, who is the National Legal Director of the ACLU and a professor at Georgetown University Law Center, a volunteer attorney for the Center for Constitutional Rights, the legal affairs correspondent for the nation, and a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books. He is the author of 10 books, and his books have received multiple awards, including the American Book Award for Enemy, Aliens, Double Standards, and Constitutional Freedoms in the War on Terrorism. His first book was No Equal Justice, and his most recent book is Engines of Liberty. He has litigated many significant constitutional cases in the Supreme Court, and he is Berkeley's 2018 Jefferson Lecturer. David, welcome to Berkeley. Well, thanks for having me. Where were you born and raised? Uh, well, I was born in Princeton, uh, raised outside of New Haven, Connecticut, and then in Evanston, Illinois, uh, but I've been on the East Coast ever since college. And uh, how, looking back, how, do you, how did your parents influence your thinking about the world? Well, my parents were uh, deeply interested in education. My dad was an English professor, uh, first at Yale and then at Northwestern. My mom was a public school teacher. They were um, uh, also deeply Catholic uh, and uh, deeply liberal. Uh, and so, you know, I think taught me to care about ideas and to care about education, but mostly to care about the vulnerable and to care about uh, social justice. And what got you interested in the law and civil liberties? Well, I kind of backed into uh, law and civil liberties. I, I went to uh, Yale uh, uh, undergraduate and was an English major. I, 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 when I graduated, I thought I wanted to become a journalist, uh, but I hadn't written uh, for the school newspaper. I had no, you know, all, I had written lots of papers as an English uh, major, but I'd been on the swim team, so you spend most of your time underwater. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I thought, well, I have to, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try freelancing, um, but I have to justify my existence uh, uh, while I'm freelancing. And one of the options was um, continuing my liberal arts education by applying to Yale Law School, which I did. It was the only law school I applied to because I had zero interest in being a lawyer, but I liked being in New Haven, and I heard that Yale Law School was a, a, a way to continue a liberal arts education, really. Um, I got waitlisted, uh, and I um, had made other plans. Um, and then uh, the very end of the summer, uh, August 1980, I guess, I got a, a call. I was actually in Colorado. I got a call from my mom saying, the Yale Law School just called. If you can be there in a week, um, you have a space. So I was clearly the last person to get into that class. Somebody at the last minute must have pulled out. They said, how are we going to fill this slot? And you know, and then I went and I still didn't really, I still, you know, had the view I wanted to be a journalist. I started writing for the Yale Daily News, covering and you know, doing theater reviews and music reviews and film reviews, because that was my passion. I was interested in the classes, but uh, I didn't really think I wanted to be a lawyer. I took time off from law school because I thought, oh my God, I'm going to graduate and I'm going to have to become a lawyer. Uh, and I interned at the Atlantic um, uh, the first semester I took off, and then I was going to intern at the Nation the next semester that I took off. But in between that time, I worked at a place called the Center for Constitutional Rights, a nonprofit in, in uh, law firm in, in New York, and it transformed my view. And I said, I want to be a lawyer. I called the nation and said, I'm not going to come and be your intern. I'm going to stay and, and uh, working for the uh, Center for Constitutional Rights. And, and, and the, that was my uh, first job after uh, graduating and clerking. Well, you've just explained to us why your 10 books are so beautifully written. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's really true because uh, for a layman, it, it's really, uh, it leads you into uh, some really important ideas in the law. Uh, I like to ask my guests what they think is the skill, the skill set and temperament required for the kind of work they do. In your case, a lawyer, civil liberties lawyer, and so on. Uh, tenacity. Uh, it's important because these are long battles. Uh, you know, I, I never forget, I, I, I took a case on in 1987, a group of Palestinian immigrants who were uh, rounded up in, in early dawn raids and locked up in high security uh, and, and alleged to be deportable for 
uh, not for having engaged in any kind of criminal or terrorist activity, but for their affiliation with a PLO group. And I got involved in the case uh, at, at the outset. Um, and that case lasted for 21 years. Uh, finally, in 2008, so it started under Ronald Reagan. Uh, uh, Ed Meese was the attorney general. It, it continued uh, under George H.W. Bush. It continued under Bill Clinton. It continued under George W. Bush. And, and, uh, and ultimately, in 2008, the, the government finally gave up and allowed our people to, uh, to remain here. Um, but you, so you got to kind of keep your eye on the long ball. Um, you also, I think, have to be um, uh, willing to see the other side of an argument because to be effective either as a professor or as an advocate, you really can't just preach uh, your view of things. You have to understand what the opposing view is and, and be able to meet its arguments. To be able to, and, and you only meet those arguments if you take them seriously. And, and so to be a good professor, you have to force your students to meet the other side, uh, other side's arguments, and to be a, an effective advocate either in the courts or in the legislature or in the court of public opinion. I think you have to, you know, take the other side's arguments seriously and really grapple with them. In, in your book, uh, Engines of Liberty, uh, you, you say, uh, describing the people who are involved in political activism, which we'll talk about in a minute, you say they are defined by principled commitment to particular ideals, and they defend those ideals whether popular or not. So that's another quality. Exactly. And so, so you know, I mean, and 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 now, you know, at the, at the ACLU, that's you know, we're in some sense we're known for that, right? We 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 defended the rights of the Nazis to march in Skokie. We we defended. Uh, the right of a white supremacist to, you know, hold a rally in Charlottesville that ended in, you know, terrible, terrible tragedy. Um, but yeah, we 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 defend the rights of uh, of of all uh, human beings. We think they are human rights. They 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 um, vest in us because we are human. They're not owned only by people who we agree with. And and if you hold that view, and you hold that view in a principled way. Uh, then I think it's incumbent upon you to fight for those principles, whether you agree or disagree with the client. And, you know, we recognize this all the time with criminal defense lawyers, right? We don't think criminal defense lawyers are advocating in favor of murder, robbery, assault, rape. They are defending individuals who are accused of those kinds of activities, even many times when the individuals actually committed those activities in defense of a certain set of rights, rights that are owned to everybody regardless of what they do and regardless of their belief systems. And, this, and the same thing is true of the First Amendment. So yeah, so I've, I've uh, represented many people with whom I don't agree, um, but I think one of, the, one of the fortunate things I've had as a constitutional lawyer, as a public interest constitutional lawyer, is that I have always been advocating for values that I believe in. And a lot of lawyers uh, essentially are hired guns. They, they, they do the work of the client who pays them, and their job is to advance those views whether they agree with them or not. Whereas I've had the luxury of essentially being able to you know, advocate for free speech, for due process, for equal protection, sometimes on behalf of people I don't agree with, but I always am committed to the values that I'm advocating. One other aspect of your uh, writings that comes out that relates to this skill set is kind of an understanding of the law in the context of the broader political context. W where does that come from in your background? And talk a little about that. So where does that come from in my background? I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, my parents, as I said, were liberal. They were not particularly activists. I mean, my mom was a kind of um, you know, well, in some sense, she was an activist in the sense of she always uh, volunteered for, you know, get out the vote drives. And she would, you know, the first time I saw a Barack Obama sign was when he was running for state senate in Illinois. And there I went, came home when there was. I'd never heard of this guy. Who is this guy? You got to sign up. So she was active in that way. But they weren't, you know, demonstrators mm -hmm. or, or, or activists of that kind. Um, you know, I, I, I think um, I, I really came to this. Um, view, I guess, through a sense of, you know, f first of all, I was a lawyer um, uh, that argued mostly in court. 
But as I became a professor, I uh, became an, an advocate for constitutional rights and civil liberties in, in a variety of forums, right? So I was, I was doing it in speeches and lectures like I'm doing you know, here at Berkeley at the Thomas Jefferson Lecture. I was doing it in the courtroom in, 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 uh, in, in lit continuing to litigate cases, but I was also doing it in the sort of field of public opinion, writing uh, op-eds, writing columns for the nation, for the New York Review of Books. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, several years ago, I decided to um, take a look at how constitutional law really works in this country. And that's what led to the, ultimately, to the book Engines of Liberty, which is an argument uh, that in order to understand constitutional law, uh, you can't just read the cases and focus on what the courts have said and what the lawyers before the courts have argued, which is basically what we do in constitutional law when we teach it in the classroom. Um, that that's a really restricted understanding of how the uh, law develops. And in fact, when you see any serious development in constitutional law, most of the work that is done to reach that result is done outside of the courtroom, sometimes by lawyers, but often just by citizens, citizens committed to you know, a particular idea and willing to work in a variety of forums whether it's state legislatures, state courts, city councils, uh, universities, religious groups. I mean, there's so, one of the great things about America, as robust a democracy as we have, is that there are so many forums. And so if your argument is not going to prevail in the Supreme Court of the United States today, uh, then you don't bring a case to the Supreme Court today. And in, but but you, there's lots of other forums you can, you can choose. So uh, before we talk about your three books. L talk a little and briefly about your role at the ACLU. You've given some sense of, of what it's doing, but tell us a little about your role as the chief attorney. Yeah, so I was uh, hired to be the national legal director um, in the summer of 2016. Uh, the national legal director oversees uh, all of our work. We have 300 attorneys, 100 in the national office, and then 200 in the affiliates. The ACLU is a um, has an affiliate in every state, essentially, in the United States. So we have people on the ground at the local level, but we also have sort of subject matter experts at the uh, national level. And I oversee them all in, you know, in, in some sense, but particularly the national uh, uh, legal staff. I also, um, anything that goes to the Supreme Court through, uh, from the ACLU, a petition for Supreme Court review or opposing another side's petition for Supreme Court review or a merits case where we represent a client or an amicus brief where we file a brief in support of another case in which we're not the principal lawyers. Those all come through my office. I you know, have to sign off on them. I edit them. I strategize about what they ought to say, um, approve them uh, and, and, and the like. So. But, I, but the, job is a, you know, the job has changed dramatically from what I thought it was going to be when I accepted the job. So think back to the summer of 2016. I was recruited to this job uh, by Anthony Romero, the executive director, who said to me, he said, David, I've got an offer you can't refuse. You've been practicing constitutional law for 30-some years under a conservative majority Supreme <laughs> Court. Just think what it would be like to help run the ACLU and run its, its Supreme Court docket under a liberal majority Supreme Court. Because at that time, of course, we all knew Hillary Clinton was going to win the presidency. She was going to name Justice Scalia's successor. And for the first time in four decades, the court would have a liberal uh, majority. Uh, so I thought, wow, that's a great opportunity. And I signed on the bottom line. You know, didn't put in any what if because nobody thought there'd be any, any what if. Uh, Obviously, the job changed dramatically on November 8th when President Trump was elected. Um, but in many ways, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much more important job now. It's, it's more defensive than, than it is offensive. Uh, we are you know, putting out fires as much as advancing you know, new uh, con conceptions of constitutional rights and liberties. But hey, but that's, what, that's part of what we are supposed to be about, right? We are the uh, ACLU, we defend the Bill of Rights, when those rights are attacked, uh, we are most needed. And I think you know one of the things that I find really um, uh, buoying about this period is the incredible 
citizen engagement around civil rights and civil liberties, from the Women's March to the people who went out to airports to demonstrate against the Trump Muslim ban to the to the, uh, the town halls about the Affordable Care Act and like, and we see that at the ACLU. So before Trump was elected, we had 400,000 members. Today we have 1.75 million members. It's quite a change and quite a change in the environment. Uh, let's take you on a journey through some of these ideas in your books. The, your, your first book was the one on the criminal justice system, uh, No Equal Justice. And in that book, you raise an important argument about structure. And in a way, it's a theoretical explanation of uh, the, the old French saying that the law is equal, both the rich and the poor can sleep under the bridge. Uh, explain why structure means that a system that, that uh, helps us understand a system in which uh, equality before the law, even when attempts are made to implement that, comes out with different outcomes because there's a privileged part of the society and then there's the very poor. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I took the title No Equal Justice from a quote from a Supreme Court opinion that said something like, there can be no equal justice as long as the kind of trial a man gets depends upon the amount of money he has. And that is a core you know, um, ideal of our criminal justice system, right? Everybody has the same rights. The rights of criminal defendants, whether, you know, Fourth Amendment rights with respect to uh, uh, investigations and searches and seizures, or Fifth Amendment rights with respect to interrogations, or Sixth Amendment rights, which are the rights that cover your right to a fair trial, your right to a lawyer uh, uh, in that trial, your right to confront witnesses against you. Those rights don't apply to the rich, they apply to everybody, right? They're, they're uh, across the board rights. And as the court said, there can be no equal justice as long as the kind of trial a man gets depends upon the amount of money he has. But of course, we know that the kind of trial a man gets depends upon the amount of money he has because if you're poor, you rely on a public defender who often is very committed and, some, and often very good, but very overextended. If you're rich, you can hire the best lawyers in the country, and you can hire a big team, and they can spend you know rem incredible resources defending you, and and you know you just get a very different kind of justice. So, the argument of the book was is, is essentially that in name these rights are equal, but in practice, in the way they work, um, the we we have adopted uh, rules. Uh, and systems that have the effect of securing these rights to the privileged, but saving on the costs of these rights by denying them effectively to the underprivileged. And what I mean by saving on the costs of these rights is that, you know, all these rights have costs, right? I mean, most of them, there's a cost between protecting rights and, uh, and, and protecting our safety. If we got rid of the Fourth Amendment tomorrow, if we said the police could search your house or your backpack or your car without any probable cause, without a warrant from a judge, you know, the police would have, a, would have an easier time catching criminals and they might keep us more secure from criminals. But we would be very vulnerable to the state, right? So there's a balance to be struck there. You know, the more you protect privacy, the more you make it hard for the police to do their job in the interest of protecting Americans' privacy, you know, the, the greater uh, risk that there will be more crime that is not, uh, uh, not un, uh, captured and, and brought to justice. And, and what I argue in the book is that, you know, liberals tend to, tend to sort of favor rights and conservatives tend to favor uh, protection of public safety. Uh, but in fact, what we have done in our system is we have struck two balances. So the rich get their rights protected, uh, but we save on the cost in terms of public safety that extending those same rights across the board by denying them effectively uh, to the poor, uh, to minorities and the like. And, and so you, know, you see that in things like the um, the, 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 the right to counsel, where, yeah, everybody has a right to a lawyer, and you have a right to a lawyer paid for by the state if you can't afford one. 
But in reality, the kind of resources that we put behind indigent defense are so limited that public defenders and lawyers who defend the poor are just incapable of doing the kind of work that they would need to do to provide equal justice to the kind of trial a man gets when he has the money to pay for a lawyer. And, and you go on to argue that remedies would, uh, one of the remedies that one would look for is building the communities that the poor come from so there could be penalties that would be such a shaming that would be enforced uh, by the community and thereby make the law more legitimate to, to those communities. Yeah, well I think, you know, I, I guess I, I think two things. I, I, I did talk about the, 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 the Japanese model essentially, which is to um, involve the community in the punishment of, a, of someone who has committed a crime. And by the community, they mean the person's family, the person's teacher or teachers, the person's coach or coaches, the person's religious minister, anyone who is, you know, plays an important role in that person's life. Involve them in, in sort of the, the collective punishment and condemnation of the individual for what he did as wrong, or the act that he did as wrong, but at the same time, commit them to reintegrating and helping this individual move beyond that crime. Whereas in our country, we don't involve the community, uh, and we don't do much at all to try to reintegrate, and we just lock people up and throw away the key. And then, then once, you know, once they get out, because they do eventually get out, they have no resources and, and no, nobody to sort of hold them up and, and, and support them. So um, I talked about that as one, uh, one possible way of, 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 of re responding. I, I now believe, I guess, that it's, bro it's so much broader than that, 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 that really we ask the criminal justice system too much if we ask it to solve these problems. Because these problems don't come from the criminal justice system as such. They come from the circumstances into which people are born, the vast disparities in uh, wealth and opportunity that we have in this country. And so, you know, if you grow up in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a part of town where, you know, most of the people don't have jobs and where most of the people don't have, you know, intact families and where there's tremendous uh, drug, uh, 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 drug and gang activity, it's going to be really hard for you to, to make it and, and, and sort of asking the criminal justice system to solve that problem, I think, you know, is a real mismatch. Uh, in your book on uh, engines of liberty, you're looking at the broader political context in which the Constitution changes over time. Uh, and uh, you're, you're, you, there are two case studies in there that are quite uh, different and remarkable in their own way, but both following the same journey. One is gay marriage, and the other is gun rights, uh, both involved significant individuals who saw the problem from their personal experience and then went on this journey over time to touch all the political bases in a way uh, to then change the Constitution. Talk about gay rights first. So yeah, so um, you know the, the basic idea of this book was like how do you explain the fact that marriage equality went from unthinkable which is what it was 25, 30 years ago, to inevitable, which is what it was in 2015 when the Supreme Court was, you know, heard argument in the case. There was no question it was going to come out in favor of marriage equality at that point. How did that, how did that happen? And similarly with, uh, with gun rights, um, uh, Warren Burger, who was the conservative Republican Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, said in 1991, that he thought the notion that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to bear arms was the, one of the greatest frauds perpetrated on the American people uh, by a special interest group in his lifetime. That was 1991, conservative Republican Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The notion that Second Amendment protects an individual right to bear arms is a fraud. 2008, Supreme Court recognizes 
an individual right to bear arms. So how did those changes come about? So, and, and in many respects, you know, one, one, one is a right, is a conservative cause, and the other is a liberal cause, but they're both, um, they, they share uh, a, a quite a bit in, in that they were um, driven, I argue, not by clever arguments in the Supreme Court. I mean, the people who argued in the Supreme Court were very good in both, you know, in both cases. But it wasn't that, you know, they came up with some new argument and uh, and the court recognized, oh, well, we were wrong for a long time. They did tremendous work outside of the Supreme Court, outside of the federal courts, to shift the uh, essentially to shift sort of public opinion, elite opinion. Um, uh, uh, political opinion so that an argument that was unthinkable in time one became thinkable in time two. So like on, on marriage equality, 1972, a gay couple sued for the right to marry. Their argument was considered so frivolous that the, when, when it went up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court rejected it with a single sentence saying, doesn't present a, any serious question. We're not even going to consider it. 1972. They, their arguments were violates equal protection, denying same-sex marriage. The, 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 people the gay, the the gay couples' yeah. arguments were that it violates equal protection and due process to deny same-sex couples the right to marry that, that opposite-sex couples have. Rejected out of hand, right? 2015, that argument went, those arguments went. The same arguments. The legal arguments didn't change. And the court, you say, well, maybe the court changed, right? Well, the court did, it was in, in 2015 was different from 1972. But if anything, the court in 2015 was more conservative than the court in 1972, which was sort of the tail end of the Warren Court, the most liberal court in American history. So the justices, the court didn't become more liberal. The arguments didn't change. What changed? Well, the world changed. Uh, and how did the world change? It didn't just happen to change. It changed because of a, a group of, of committed individuals who came together in, in, in organizations like Lambda Legal Defense Fund or GLAD, which is a um, Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders in Boston, or the ACLU's um, Gay and Lesbian Rights Project. And they worked together to uh, advance the ball in an incremental fashion using forums other than the Supreme Court because they knew they'd lose in the Supreme Court, using forms other than the Supreme Court, going to city councils, going to progressive universities and trying to get them to recognize domestic relationships, domestic partnerships, whether they were same sex or opposite sex. Um, getting anti-discrimination laws enacted in progressive cities and then progressive states that included discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Getting family law to be you know, amended in various incremental ways to recognize the validity of of, of gay families. And only then did they go to, co to courts and they went to state courts and they went to, they picked their states. So they went to Vermont, uh, most liberal state in the country. Now, you know, not saying anything about California, but Vermont. <laughs> uh, and and they, they made arguments based only on state constitutional law that there was a right to marry. Uh, because if they made an argument based on federal constitutional law, that could be reviewed by the Supreme Court, and they knew they weren't ready to go to the Supreme Court. Uh, and they won civil unions, which is not entirely marriage, but it's you know a big step in, in Vermont. Then they took that same tactic and went to Massachusetts, got marriage there, got a, a right to marriage under Massachusetts state law there, took it to Connecticut, got it there, Iowa, California, got it there temporarily until Proposition 8. And they, so it was a state by state incremental strategy. And only once there was a significant sort of critical mass of states that had recognized this right, did they seek to make the argument in the federal courts? Uh, and the NRA did the same thing, you know, not starting in Vermont and Massachusetts, but Florida and Alabama on the individual right to bear arms. Let's take the case of the gay uh, marriage uh, equality uh, decision. Uh, it, it's about all, all this political work at different levels and different forms uh, it ultimately impacts ideas, yeah. the idea of what is appropriate. And, and you trace in there how the notion that we shouldn't have gay marriage because we don't like it, we, have, we morally disapprove of it, that gets dropped by the wayside. But it's over time as people come to see that that's not a good argument. And then the argument about love, two 
gay persons can love each other. So, so it's, it, as all this political activity is going on, ideas and thinking are changing, and those ideas are coming from a groundswell uh, in different forms and in different places. Absolutely. I mean, it was, it was, it was very much affected by, by um, gay uh, people coming out. Right. As long as gay people felt so um, oppressed that they hid their uh, sexual identity, uh, then you know many people didn't even know that they knew anyone who was gay. Um, but once you, you know you 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 protected gay people sufficiently that they could come out, uh, and they started to come out, and it was you know it became accepted to come out. Then suddenly, almost everybody knew somebody in their family or in their neighborhood who was gay and out, and it's much harder to demonize. And then you know the the groups, uh, so the groups supported those kinds of activities, coming out, the sort of the politi politicization of sexual identity was an important part of the fight. Uh, uh, public education was an important part of the fight. One of the groups that I that I um, uh, feature in the book is is an organization that all they did was um, put pressure on Hollywood and the television industry and the news media to portray gay people in a positive light, not to portray them as sort of some weird, you know, sexual uh, 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 perverts or something, but to per 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 portray them as normal, you know, human beings, which is what they are after all. And and that was important also to the to the evolution of an understanding, the normalization essentially of uh, of different sexual orientations. And and then we all, you know, I, I also talk about the way in which the the organizations learned that in order to be effective at communicating and persuading the persuadables, um, it was it was it was not so effective to talk about this as a civil rights issue. It was much more effective to talk about it as a love and commitment issue, um, because if you talk about it as a civil rights issue, then you're sort of saying the, the sort of implicit message is if you're against us, you're like those racists and those anti-immigrant people, and that's not a message that's likely to pull people along. Whereas you talk about it as, you know, these are people who, who love each other, who are willing to make a lifelong commitment. Shouldn't they have the same right to? Uh, to, to, to have their relationships recognized uh, that, pe that two people of the, of the opposite sex have. It's about, marriage is not about a right, it's about love and commitment. And that turned out to be a very effective uh, rhetorical strategy to bring people, you know, get people over. And eventually, you know, po popular opinion was uh, significantly in, in support of marriage equality. The other chapter uh, in, in the book that struck me is the ARA, uh, the NRA's yeah. uh, effort and success in winning uh, Second Amendment rights for the individual. And, and their uh, lock on the political system that emerges over time. Uh, which in the present environment with the gun uh, murders in Florida just recently uh, really helps us understand how once a constitutional right is r recognized, how difficult it is to change the political system. Well, yeah, I mean, the NRA is a, is a fascinating study. And, so, and, and, and for me, that, that section of the book is in some sense the most Interesting. Um, they they understand. I think that the power of the NRA is they understand the democratic underpinnings of constitutional rights. Right. We tend to think of constitutional rights as being counter democratic. Right. They're in the Bill of Rights. Even if the majority wants to tread on the First Amendment, the courts are there, and lawyers are there to defend the unpopular. But in fact, in fact, if you can get the people to support your right and to understand your conception as a right that's worth protecting, you're in much stronger hands. And, and what the NRA did was use the power of democracy to advance a, what they view as a constitutional right under the Second Amendment. So for 100 years, the courts had said there is no individual right to bear arms under the Constitution. But the NRA, and the NRA knew, you, we're not going to be able to file a case in federal court. And, change that because the courts have said the same thing for 100 years. They don't tend to reverse themselves very easily. So instead, they went to the states. 
And they went state by state. They started often in Florida, you know, ironically, given you know what's mm -hmm. going on in Florida right now in the wake of the of the, the high school shooting there. But they started in Florida, which was very supportive of gun rights. And then they'd take the victory there to Alabama, to Mississippi, all the way around the country. So that by the time 2008 came around, and the Supreme Court was actually taking up this case, should the federal constitution protect the individual right to bear arms? The NRA had already made sure that virtually every state in the country recognized an individual right to bear arms by virtue of their own state constitutions, which had been amended or interpreted to that effect, or by virtue of state, uh, um, state laws. And the NRA didn't even stop there. It, all, it, it also got Congress to enact laws that recognized an individual right to bear arms. Uh, and they got the executive branch under George uh, uh, W. Bush and under Attorney General John Ashcroft to reverse its position of you know, many decades that there was not an individual right to bear arms and to reverse its position so that it was recognizing a, a, a Second Amendment individual right to bear arms. So by the time it went to the Supreme Court, the NRA had gotten the states, Congress, and the executive on board with the idea that there's an individual right to bear arms. Well, at that point, it's not that hard for the Supreme Court to come along for the ride. But even so, even after the court recognized that, I argue that the most effective protection or protector of gun rights in this country is not the Second Amendment, it's not the court, it's the NRA. Because they're able to stop laws from getting enacted that clearly would be constitutional, and they're able to get gun rights laws enacted that are clearly not required by the Constitution. And they do it through their members. They have five million members. Uh, they have 15 million others who, who say they're members but don't pay their dues. And what one guy from the NRA told me was, well, we'd love to have their dues. But what we really want is their identification with the NRA so that when we say act you know, on this bill or that bill, they will. And that's why even in the wake of horrific, horrific you know, mass shootings, we see so little action uh, in, in the political branches. In a way, the, the NRA is a movement. Basically, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. With, with clubs and so on, and the notion that you're going to take something away that I have mobilizes those people when they get the word from the NRA or, or when they, they see their uh, read what's going on in the newspaper. But there's another point that you make, uh, which is very interesting, and that is that there's something in the American ethos, the political culture the myth of the frontiersman, the individual, that in a way the gun issue taps on that. So it's, it's almost a default benefit, so to speak, uh, that, they, that they have when they're making their case. Yeah, I think they're, they're, they're appealing to the notion of the, the rugged individual, the, the, you know, the homesteader, the person who goes out on the frontier, you know, takes a plot of land, grows some things, and, you know, he, he, those people didn't have uh, anybody to protect them. There wasn't a police chief in town, they, and so they protected themselves. And the gun, you know, is, is a stand-in for that notion of rugged individualism, self-protection, uh, self-defense, really. Um, and, and that does play into, I think, a, a particularly American conception of the individual. Uh, and again, particularly still today on the frontier, in rural areas much more so than in urban areas where pop, the populations are overwhelmingly in favor of gun control. And you know, understandably, they, they, they don't feel that they have to defend themselves because the police are there. They're patrolling and hearing the sirens all the time. If you're out in the middle of nowhere in you know, Utah or Wyoming, the police aren't gonna protect you, right? So you feel like I've gotta protect myself. Uh, and their uh, gun rights are, are very, very popular. So, so the question is, can, can a social movement, and we're seeing a new kind of social movement with high school students, and not only in the high school where this horrific incident occurred, but linking to other high schools in the state and maybe nationally, uh, can, can, we, can we hope, uh, or what is your perspective on how that might change things because this lock of on the of the NRA has it's it's literally they can target a politician who votes against them yeah so I think look you know if you had if you had asked me in 1991 will the Supreme Court recognize an individual right to bear arms 
I would have said, no way, because for 100 years they hadn't, and the, you know, conservative Supreme Court justice said the idea was a fraud. That's not just we won't recognize it, but it's a fraud. Uh, and yet, 18 years later, the Supreme Court recognized it. And if you had asked me in, you know, 1985 or 90, you know, will the Supreme Court recognize marriage equality? I said, no. They, you know, there's no, no way. The court, the, that's, it's just not even, it's not thinkable. And yet, it, in both instances, what was unthinkable became thinkable by virtue of exactly what those high school students are doing now, which is political action around a, con a conception of, of a right, of a, of, a, of a sense of justice. And so, you know, the question will be, can that be continued? Uh, can it be um, multiplied? Will it grow? Um, right now, it's got a lot of support, and I think because it's high school kids who can speak for themselves and who are very sympathetic, it, it could well grow. And I also think because I would say Americans generally um, are much more primed to engage politically now than they were before Trump's election because of what Trump's election signifies. So the Women's March, uh, you know, on the first day after the inauguration was, you know, unheard of national, uh, you know, sort of came up out of the blue, national, you know, uh, pro, uh, pro demonstrations across this country in all kinds of, uh, of cities and states, even internationally. And that, I think there's some blend over to this issue. But gun control folks have a lot of work to catch up to the uh, gun rights uh, advocates. While the NRA was doing this work all along and doing it in the states at the local level, the gun control folks were focused in Washington, only focused on Congress, not fighting the local battles, and so they lost. You know, um, Mayor Bloomberg's uh, Every Town for Gun Safety is an attempt to kind of mimic what the ACLU, what the NRA has done, and to build uh, a local movement, nationally coordinated local movements. Uh, in favor of gun control, and you know, I think this it, it, this could be the beginning of that uh, of that effort. Uh, how successful it will be will depend on to what extent people continue to fight, and to what extent the NRA fights back. Uh, one thing I would suggest is that uh, your book uh, "Engines of Liberty" be adopted by high, all the high schools. In well, the there, country. there you go. <laughs> there you go. A, a prescription for action. Uh, okay. Exactly. So, in, in this last segment of the program, uh, you've you've described to us the job you thought you were taking. Hillary was going to get elected, so on and so forth. We're now in a world that's strange, strangely different, and it's 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 kind of a transition to a plutocracy in a way, it appears generally. And then, you know, there are all kinds of uh, social forces uh, at work. I, I listed some of them here. Nationalism, which then says, well, why should we pay attention to international law, which yeah. is a linchpin of, of your book on uh, the rights of uh, accused uh, terrorists. Uh, libertarianism, uh, dismantle the welfare state, and privatize prisons, basically. So, so putting more and more people in prison is a profitable undertaking. Money in politics, uh, thereby controlling the legislatures uh, with programs like ALEC, where legislation is, is written in advance. And then the whole issue of technology. You know, the way, what is freedom of speech in the context of Facebook's platform and the intervention by external actors to corrupt what we think of as praise. So I, I'm just, how are you thinking about the big picture now that your job description <laughs> was wrong with regard to what aspect, which was the environment you would be operating in? Right. Well, that's a big question yes, and, and, I, but, yeah. and a great question and one we ask ourselves every day at the ACLU. Um, and, and many other organizations as well. And I guess my sense is there are there there are many troubling there are many troubling indicators, you know. And you've listed a bunch of them. Um, I think the vast disparity between the uh, 
to, between the rich and the poor today, you know, it's the second Gilded Age, is, is a driver of so many of them. But, it, you know, you see it in the hyper-partisan character, you see it in the divided media, you see it in uh, the, the sort of turn to populism, you see it in the fact that there is a sizable percentage of the American people that are not embarrassed by Donald Trump. Uh, but actually, like Donald Trump, um, you know that, that these are these are troubling indicators. And um, but I guess I I think what we need to do is really twofold. The first thing we need to do is we need to defend the values that this country was based on, uh, and those values are, you know, among them, um, basic human rights for all people, which is a concept that says everybody's equal. Right? We are not, there is not one set of rights for rich people, one set of rights for poor people. That was my critique of the criminal justice system is we're not living up to our ideals. But at the ACLU, we fight to ensure that our system does, you know, live up to its ideals as, as best as we uh, can. And when a president like Trump is in office, um, many basic rights and liberties are under attack. Voting rights, uh, reproductive freedom, immigrants' rights, due process. Uh, L LGBT rights, and he's chosen to attack all of these. And so, you know, the first thing we need to do is defend them. Um, and we are. We told President Trump, if you, you know, go down this road, we'll see you in court. That's our tagline. And we have sued him in case after case. And for the most part, thus far, the courts have ruled with us. They've enjoined the, the travel ban directed at Muslim countries. They've enjoined the transgender military ban, which President Trump put in place by Twitter without even, you know, consulting the leaders of the military, um, they've enjoined the uh, the uh, ending of, uh, of of the termination of DACA, the program for the young people who came here, um, uh, br their parents brought them here illegally, uh, and are undocumented. Um, they have uh, enjoined. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Trump administration's efforts to block access to abortion of young undocumented women that they have in federal custody. Um, so, um, so in some sense, we're winning in the courts. Uh, we're, we're defending those basic rights and values, and that's part one. But part two, I think, is you gotta move beyond defense. defense. And you have to appeal to a positive vision. And the positive vision, I think, is that we are not a country that is that has to be driven by partisan divide, that has to be uh, driven by, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, 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 hatred and, and, and treating the other as, uh, as somehow less than human or, or, or illegitimate. Um, we are a country w at our best that recognizes a set of universal principles, that recognizes that we are a community, that recognizes that we have an obligation not just to better ourselves, but to uh, to protect others, uh, and that's what the Bill of Rights reflects. It reflects that conception, and so we're trying to put forth a positive vision that people can come together and support people from the right as well as the left uh, to move beyond this kind of bitter partisan divide. You know, whether we'll, we'll succeed, I think, depends entirely on the American people and to what extent they continue to engage uh, in, in the in the defense of these values at this time, and so far I've been encouraged by the uh, by the real you know energy. I mean, I haven't seen in my lifetime this kind of civic engagement ever before. I think the last time you saw this kind of civic engagement in America was the Vietnam War, and that was in a time when every you know young man had a self interest. <laughs> You know, now it's not, you know, it's not necessarily self-interest. When people go out to, to advocate for the dreamers or when they go to the airports to demonstrate against the Trump travel ban, they're not defending their own rights. They're defending the rights of the other. They're saying these rights are important enough that we think they should be extended to other people and we're willing to defend the rights of other people. I think that, that move is critically important to offset the kind of self-interest pure private self-interest, which I think Trump embodies. You know, his narcissism embodies sort of the extreme limit of this kind of private interest pursuit with no uh, conception of, uh, of public consequences. Uh, what about the extent to which the judiciary is being packed by uh, people selected by the Federalist Societies? Uh, 
do you think that the, the power of the ideas that will emerge in the context of this political opposition you've just described, do you think that when they're in their seats, they will be impacted by it? So the law will not go as far to one side as one might expect if we're packing so many uh, conservative justices on the courts? So the, court, so the judicial appointments are a concern because they last beyond the administration, right? If Trump does all kinds of things by unilateral executive action, which is mostly what he's done, those can be reversed by the next president if the political will is there. But if he puts people on the courts, they're there for the rest of their lives, and that could be generations. Um, so that's definitely a concern. You know, a, a, a strong showing in the midterms supporting those who believe in civil rights, civil liberties, separation of powers, the rule of law, um, would lead, you know, could lead to a Senate that, that will put a check on uh, his putting in place ideologues on the courts, and that would be an important first step. But I, I, I guess I would say, you know, sort of consistent with my book, Engines of Liberty, don't focus solely on the courts. We need to focus on the people and on the power of movements. And if those movements are powerful, they will constrain the courts. Historians have looked at the Supreme Court's decisions over time and what they and, and sort of um, correlated them to public opinion on various issues. And what they find is that the court rarely departs very substantially from public opinion. When it does, those decisions tend not to last. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm I'm very concerned about court appointments, but I think that just underscores the importance of people who care about civil liberties and civil rights engaging, engaging in the midterms, but also engaging for the long term. Let's talk a minute about the free speech issues that are raised uh, in the election, the use of technology, of uh, internet platforms to spread fake news. So it's not, it's not a question so much of defending the right of a Nazi to speak their piece uh, uh, as it is a question about the discourse is being corrupted yeah. by untruths. Not that I don't believe in somebody else's truth, but, but the whole purpose is to disrupt. Yeah. Uh, I ver this is, this is a, a very vexing uh, problem, uh, obviously, and we're only at the very beginning of sort of trying to figure out how to, how to solve it. I, I, I think, you know, were the, were the will there to, um, to, to, to disable bots, these sort of automatic spreaders, fake, fake people, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, uh, that would be an important uh, that would be one way of checking, but the but uh, of checking the sort of the reach of these kinds of things because they rely very heavily on this autom automated spread. Because if you're sending something out that's blatantly false, the likelihood that it's going to be spread by normal people is is not very high. But if you can spread it through automation, then the more people hear it, the more they're going to believe it, and then it will you know uh, affect the debate. So that seems to be one way. Um, you know, another thing that people talk about is, you know, the extent to which, how do, you, how do you control fake news? Should Facebook be in the business of determining whether your post is true or not in the same way that the New York Times is, you know, um, does fact checking on its articles? I, you know, I'm not sure that that's possible for Facebook to do. I'm not sure that Facebook, you know, the, the, if we're worried about, if, we, if we're worried under the First Amendment generally about one concentrated authority, the government, having the power to determine what's true and what's false, and we are, and that's why we don't let the government do that. The government can't say you can't engage in falsehoods um, uh, because we don't trust the government to define what's true and what's false. Um, you know, then, then shouldn't we also be worried about Facebook? You know, uh, giving Facebook that power? So, but at the same time, it seems um, inadequate to just say, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. Uh, the, you know, the, we'll, we'll rely on the marketplace of ideas um, because the marketplace has been so corrupted by money, by automation, um, uh, you know, and the like. So I think it's a, a, a real challenge for, um, 
for democracy and for civil society going forward to get a handle on how we, you know, we think about social media as distinct from, you know, organized media. Well, on that uh, note, David, I want to thank you for helping us uh, think through some of these thorny problems, some of which uh, uh, we're still working on, but others that have been worked on in the past, you've given us an account of, of how that was done. I feel a responsibility to show at least one of your books uh, to your audience. This is the Engine of uh, Liberty book. So I want to thank you uh, very much uh, for being on our program. Thanks for having me. It's been thank a delight. You. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.